Welcome this morning. <clears throat> Welcome to our church. It's lovely to be in your home this morning. And let's enjoy the presence of God. I say this every week, whether you're a part of our church or joining us from anywhere in the country or even the world via Facebook. We want you to be blessed this morning. We want you to be uplifted and we want you to join in with the songs. They've all been written by our in-house team of songwriters, but we know that you'll soon pick them up. We want you to clap your hands, to dance as if you were in the house of God. Let's enjoy the presence of the Lord with a powerful song that says, I can stand amidst all trials. Wow! What a promise God has given us. No matter what you're facing, either last week or the week to come, you can stand. We can come through this victoriously. Let's enjoy it. Stand amidst all trials, I can stand amidst all pain. I can stand when life is failing, I can stand because Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns over the earth, over our lives. Jesus reigns, we will declare he is alive. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns over the earth, over our lives. Jesus reigns, we will declare he is the light. Jesus reigns, forever crowned in victory. Jesus reigns, Jesus reigns, Jesus reigns. Reigns. We will declare he is alive. Jesus reigns forever, crowned in victory. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Amen. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns, we will declare he is alive. Jesus reigns, forever crowned in victory. Jesus reigns, Jesus reigns, Jesus reigns. Amen. I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. Jesus reigns over the earth, over our lives. Jesus reigns, we will declare he is alive. Jesus reigns forever, crowned in victory. Jesus reigns, 
Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Amen. I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. Aren't you glad? Hey, we're overcomers. Someone once said, I can't go under for rising over. And how true that is. But you know, there's coming a day. And we look around us at all the signs that are happening today. And we say, surely the coming of Jesus must be near. What a wonderful day that's going to be. When we see our Savior eyeball to eyeball. And we love him that we have loved by faith, we will see him in reality. I can't wait for that day, can you? I hear 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of
kingdom come Worthy is the Lord Seated on the throne All the glory And praise forevermore Amen to just praise him we're going to close with a, a newish song now uh, a beautiful devotional song a cry of all of our heart in this tumultuous time is let the peace of God reign within your heart you know I'm so glad that it's the peace of God Jesus promised a very different kind of peace to his children from the peace that we find in the world. The world's peace requires convenient situations. God's doesn't. It just requires God. And I'm glad that the peace of God can reign in our hearts this morning. <music> The peace of God reign within your heart. Worries and anxieties depart. Lifter of my head, the author of my faith. Since your voice calling to me, be still and know that I am your God, be still and know. Dear before you now, now let your love come down. down. Take away my fears and all. I am, I 
life safe within your hand. Your promises never be forsaken. Where would I be without your love? All that you are is more than enough. I sense your voice. Calling to me, be still and know that I am your God. Be still and know. Here before you now. Here before you now. Let, Let your, your love come down. down. Take away my fears and all my doubts. Everything I am is safe within your hand. Your promises never be forsaken. Where would I be without your love? All that you are is more than enough. I sense your voice. Calling to me, be still and know that I am your God. Be still and know. Where would I be? Where would I be without your love? All that you are is more than enough. I sense your voice calling to me. Be still and know. Where would you be without his love? Where would I be without your love? All that you are is more than enough. I sense your voice calling to me. Be still and know that I am your God. Be still and Yes, be 
Father, I pray that you will help every troubled heart and mind to be stilled right now while we're in your presence, not only here in your house, but in your presence in our homes. I pray that there will be for many a strange stillness that permeates every fiber of their being. Let that stillness right now remove all the confusions, the stress, the worries, the fears. And I pray, Father, that although they don't understand why, how they feel what they do, let them embrace your stillness and your peace. And let it change their life. Let them face the rest of this day with a new hope, with a new sense of confidence. And let this continue throughout their week. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. goodness I got so carried away there that uh, I almost said at the end what I normally do when we finish singing in our services you may all be seated <laughs> but I'd have been talking to two people <laughs> but it's lovely to be in your home and I hope in your hearts today we come to you from the Whittlesey Christian Church in the heart of the Fens a beautiful part of East Anglia and a beautiful town with an incredible community spirit. But I, I was thinking about a scripture in John that is very familiar, I'm sure, to, to all of us. But I, I, I want to just kind of dwell on it just for a few moments before Maria comes and shares her heart with you. It's taken from John, the Gospel of John, and chapter 21. And the first six verses, it says this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. So this was obviously not the first time that Jesus had showed himself. This was the second time at least. This is how he appeared to them at that time. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were all together. And Simon said, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they replied, We'll also go with you. They immediately got into their ship, and that night they caught absolutely nothing. When the morning came, Jesus was standing on the shore. Now the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you got any fish? They replied, No. So Jesus said to them, cast your net on the right side of the ship and you'll find some. So they did. And soon they were not able to pull the net back into the ship because of the multitude of fishes they had caught. What a, what a beautiful thing. But you know, I, I find, and I just want to bring these things out in these couple of moments. I, I, I want to, a couple of things about the situation that, that, that I find quite amazing. Now, I appreciate that I've got a way of looking at the Word of God that is sometimes a, a bit unusual. 
But one is certainly the amazing restraint of the fishermen. When I used to travel internationally for six weeks at a time, uh, the first day after I'd arrived home, I would set off very early in the morning and go down to a favourite spot of mine in Shropshire and, uh, and, and, and fish. And I'd be there for quite a while. And uh, it was a, a secluded place that you had to kind of plough through the trees and down the embankment and uh, a beautiful spot. And so I know what I'd do if, if I'd been all morning and hadn't caught anything, let alone all night, and somebody had dared ask me that question. Have you got any fish? Do you know, if I hadn't have been a believer, I'd have been tempted to have put them on my bait and used them as the next bait for the fish. But they were very restrained. And so that was the first thing. They just simply answered no. Now, now I don't know whether that was a no or whether it was a no. I'm not sure. But the other was the level of blindness in the disciples. Ever thought about that? It was morning. So Jesus would have been visible. It didn't say they couldn't recognize it. They just didn't recognize it was Jesus, the Bible says. So they could make out the figure. Now, they were obviously close enough to the shore to hear what Jesus was saying. Yet, though spending three years hearing his voice and seeing him, they failed to recognize either his voice or himself. I, I, I find that really amazing. Now, I could understand if the first time they had seen Jesus and the only words they had ever heard him speak was the words that he spoke that immortal day on the cross. When he said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the words when he looked to the thief that cried unto him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, today, today, you will be with me. Oh, well, now, now for... That's the only things they had ever said. And they'd only ever saw Jesus being nailed to the cross with blood pouring from his head and his hands and his feet and his side. I could understand. But three years, day and night, hearing his voice. I think if I'd have spent three years in the church, and I've spent more than that, but if after three years uh, I, I was walking down the street on the opposite side of the road uh, and I called to someone, uh, one of the congregation, and I said, Hi, how are you? And they didn't recognize either me or my voice. I, I kind of think I'd be a little bit put out. But Jesus wants them. Now, when you've toiled all night like the these were experienced fishermen. They weren't like me. I, I, I wasn't an experienced fisherman. I'd been immersed in meetings two, three, sometimes four times a day for six weeks. I'd always been with people. And I was desperate to just be alone with my own company in a beautiful, watery, wooded area. Jesus looked at them and he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Now, these were experienced fishers. There wasn't a part of the boat at any time through the night that they would not have tried. They knew the habits of the fish. They knew those waters. They were not strange waters to them. 
They lived in that area. There wasn't anything about the water that they didn't know. And it would have been easy for them to turn around and say, oh, we've done that, you don't know what you're talking about. But they didn't. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. Now, one of the great dangers of trying so many things in our own strength should these disciples have ever decided to go fishing? Was there a justification in that? Not really. It wasn't as though Jesus had not appeared to them. It said so right at the very beginning. Showed himself again to the disciples. This time at the Sea of Tiberias. It wasn't as though they weren't, they were ignorant of what was going to happen on that day and why Jesus was being crucified. He had told them that he had to die for the sins of the people. He had to die. His blood had to be shed so that you and I could find peace with God. The only way that we can find peace with God this morning is through repentance and trust in the blood of Christ. Because Jesus had gone to great lengths to explain all of that. Yet, despite seeing that he had risen from the dead, they decided to go about their old ways and their old jobs. And the things that brought them their livelihood. But how gracious Jesus was. You know, the thing I also saw in here, how that Jesus never bears grudges. We do. Jesus could have easily been offended at what the disciples had done. But he didn't. And he showed them exactly how to change things. You see, one of the dangers of doing things in your own strength is that we could so easily come to a point where we lose heart. We've tried everything. How many times have I prayed with people over the years and said, tried that, done that, been there, got the T-shirt, you can see this look of absolute desperation in their eyes. I've prayed. I've prayed many times. Nothing has happened. And that's the problem, isn't it? You see, can I suggest just a question here? Could it be it was not what they were doing, but when? And possibly how they were doing it. You see, you and I can do the right thing, but in the wrong spirit. It can be a spirit of anger. It can be a spirit of frustration, of despair, uh, and also doubt. So, it's not necessarily that We've done the wrong things in the past. It could be that we've done them under our own strength. We had to find a way. I, I, I recall this nation going through an economic problem. And many of the church leaders sent a petition to Parliament, to number 10, and called on the then Prime Minister... Let's have a day of prayer for our nation. The reply was very simple. We are not at we are not that bad yet. We have many other things that we can try. We do not need to resort to that. But you see, things got worse. They never did get better. 
Sometimes we need, instead of trying to desperately shut God out, we need to bring him in. I remember going through a very challenging situation many years ago now. And I recall a lesson God taught me through that. Because I was blaming God that he wasn't hearing, he wasn't doing anything about the situation. It was only getting worse. And one day, in my anger, God broke through. In my frustration, God broke through. Because he's my father. He's your father. And he cares about his children. And he understands their humanity. And I remember him saying, it was as though there was a, a light that got switched on in my eyes. It was as though there was a booming voice in my heart. It could have been audible. It was so real. He said, son, I cannot put my hand on your situation until you take your hand off it. And how true that is. And you know, oddly enough, the hardest thing, even though I couldn't do anything, the hardest thing to do was to take my hand off the situation. And I recall as though it were today, coming to a point when I looked up to God and I said, God, if this doesn't matter to you, then it doesn't matter to me. It's yours. I'm doing nothing more. And I literally took my hand off that situation. I never prayed about it again. And yet the amazing thing was that it was weeks later, it suddenly dawned on me that the situation had changed. I can't remember when. I can't remember how. But I can remember when it became obvious to me. And so let me encourage you this morning. If, if you're at wit's end and you've done all that you know what to do, just because you, you think there's no hope doesn't mean there isn't. Be still and know that beautiful song that I am God. Just still your heart. Let the lesson he taught me become today the lesson he teaches you. If you've done everything, take your hand off. Take your hand off that situation. Give it to God. As Jesus said, cast all your care on me because I care for you. Be encouraged this morning. You, like me, will look back. You probably may not even know the moment God broke through. But one day, your eyes will be opened and you'll know it happened. God bless you and be rejoicing in your heart this morning because he cares for you. God bless you. Maria, thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here. I hope you're all keeping well. It's great that the sun's shining for a change. We've had a bit of a, a, a rainy week, but, you know, we mustn't complain. But the sun is shining today. Okay, I've got a word from God that I want to share with you this morning. Let me ask you a question. What is a definition of the past? What is a definition of the past? Is it something that's happened years and years ago? Not necessarily, is it? The past could be something that's happened five minutes ago. It may have happened a few minutes ago. But it's something that has gone before. And what I want to um, talk about this morning, what I believe God has shared with me to share 
um, with, with yourselves this morning is moving on, letting go of the past. But there's two aspects to this title. Letting go of the past, it's your choice. Because in life, nobody can force us to do anything. It is a choice that we have. So the title is, Let Go of the Past. It's your choice. You know, I was saying about uh, the past isn't necessarily years and years ago. Yes, of course, anything from, uh, that has happened before um, is the past. And, you know, it could be that we were content. It could be that we felt safe, secure um, in ourselves. Um, and then something happened. Maybe it was something that somebody said, did, that kind of all of a sudden just made us feel very different. Maybe it hurt us. Maybe it caused disappointment. Maybe it was something positive that really changed our life, some news that really changed. But quite often, um, the things that hang on to us are the things that aren't so positive in our lives. You know, we leave our houses every morning, don't we? Whether I mean, I know it's difficult at the moment, but um, you know that could be um, for work. It could be to go to the shop. At the moment, maybe you don't go to school or uh, college, but you know we can leave the house and something happen, and then we never go back home, or we go it, something happens and then we go back home very very different. Accidents happen, don't they? You know, somebody leaves the house as they normally do. And then a call comes to say that a loved one's been involved in an accident. But you see, those things we cannot plan for. But you know, quite often things that are said in our past, things that are said can actually stay with us for a long, long time. And the Bible actually talks about this as being a curse. And I want to look at that later on in the message about what, what a curse actually is. Um, but I think about things that were said to me in the past um, that really knocked my confidence, uh, that made me feel that, um, you know, I wasn't good enough, inferior. And it was something that took me many, many years to overcome. And they were the words that were spoken, maybe not deliberately, maybe just, you know, indifferently, but they stayed with me. You know, you're no good, you're never going to make it. But, you know, those things can stay with you. And they're the sorts of things that um, we find very difficult to actually shake off our lives. And these things can stay with us and be an obstacle for us. They can be an obstacle in, in enabling us to move forward. And, you know, as Christians, Satan can quite often use those things that have happened in the past um, to really um, prevent us from getting deeper into our relationship with God. And, you know, they are lies. The, the, the enemy is a liar. And, uh, you know, he'll want to convince us of those things. So if we've been told that we're no good, he's going to convince us, convince us that we are no good. But um, I want to show you, um, you know, we have to be very careful about what we say, don't we? Um, just a couple of scriptures from the Bible that talks about the power of the tongue. And that's in Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So, you know, the, what we say can either bring life to somebody, so make them feel enriched and positive, or it can destroy and, uh, and bring death. In James 3, verses 7 to 12, it says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So the Bible there is talking about the damaging effects that, uh, that words can bring. Uh, they can actually cause that curse over our life. 
You know, so many of us can be affected um, and living with the consequences of, of those things that have been said over our lives in the past. Some can be carried for absolutely years. You know, they can be things that we've convinced ourselves are true about us, just like I did with my inferiority complex before God put his finger on that and said, no, you're a child of mine. You're not inferior. You're not um, always going to be walking in somebody's shadow. You've got a purpose and a calling that I have ordained over your life. And, you know, we need to recognise that. And it's important that we move on from the past. Living in the past is dangerous. You know, good things, yes. Memories, yes. But, uh, you know, good memories. But things that have happened that are still affecting us and um, bringing us um, confusion, bringing us tension, hindering our walk, walk with God, they are the things that God wants us to put behind. And that's what this message is all about today. We need to move on from the past. Let's see what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah 42, verse 9. It says, See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. And before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, it says, Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So the scripture is encouraging us there to forget the former things and not to dwell on those things that have happened, not to dwell on those things that people have said about us. Um, but we need to let go of those things to be set free so that we can be the person that God intended us to be without those shackles, without those burdens, without those uh, lies and those curses on us. Do you know, I want to cover now um, some points as to why sometimes we find it difficult to let go of the things of the past. Just five points here that I want to share that prevent us from letting go of the past and those things that can prevent us from moving on in the things of God and, the pers and being the person that God wants us to be. So the first one, the first reason why we find it difficult to let go of the past, number one, is we have a deep-rooted fear in our lives. We're not always aware that we have that fear, but... You know, there's, there's many things that can have a deep root in our lives. Maybe we've had a, a disappointment in our life. We've been let down. Maybe your relationship or your marriage has broken down. Maybe you think God has abandoned you and you're struggling in your faith. You know, you're facing a situation where you're dreading what the outcome can be. It could be a health-related issue. It could be a financial issue. And you can be anxious thinking, well, you know, what if that happens? What if there's no way forward? What if my whole world crumbles? And everything that you have, everything that you've worked for is lost. And you lose your self-respect and everything that goes with that. You know, Job, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the man Job, uh, he had a, a, a fear in his life. And, uh, and God, uh, God dealt with that fear. You know, Job was a wealthy man. He was a God-fearing and upright man who was obedient to God. Um, you know, even when things started to go wrong in his life, um, he still retained that faith up to a certain point. Um, and he said, I won't, I won't turn against my God. I will, I will stay faithful. But as the heat of that challenge came... And Satan was given free reign to challenge Job. It did affect Job. And God actually, in that experience, highlighted a fear in his life. I mentioned that Job was a wealthy man and he had his family around him and he had wealth, security, he had livestock. And um, when Job went through that test, everything was taken from him. Absolutely everything his family, his finances, wealth, the animals, 
everything and then sickness came. So you can imagine that Job was in quite a bad way. And in the midst of that, in Job 3, verse 25, he said, What I feared has come upon me. What I have dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. You know, sometimes we have to allow God to actually uproot that fear in our life. Not just pick the top off, but to uproot it. Because we know like with weeds, if you just snap the top off that weed, the root is still there and it will spring back again and again and again. But we need to uproot, we need to allow God to pull out that fear, roots and all, so that it doesn't come back. But we need to allow God to reveal that to us. Now, because sometimes we're not always... We won't always acknowledge that there is that fear in our lives. But when Job was set free from that fear, he went on and God blessed him abundantly. And he was a a free man, no longer held to ransom by that fear. And you know, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 14, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me, and when you do, you will find me, when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. So that was the first point, was why, how we find it difficult to move on from the past. The second point, second reason why uh, we may find it difficult to move on from the past is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. It may be that I mentioned earlier that somebody has hurt us or um, said something to us, um, be it deliberately or unintentionally, but it's caused us hurt and pain and we've held on to it in our lives. Maybe it's caused a bitterness and an anger and a resentment in us. Um, and, you know, if that's, not, if that's not dealt with, it will eat away at us, it will gnaw away at us and it will damage us ultimately, it will destroy us. And I was speaking about the curse, wasn't I, of the spoken word um, in the past and how I um, dealt with my inferiority complex from, uh, even from a child. And, uh, you know, I had to forgive. I had to forgive those that, in this case, it was my late father, who, I, who is now with the Lord. But there were many things that were said over my life that almost destroyed me. But, you know, as I came to that point of forgiveness, I knew that God was challenging me to forgive my father for those things that he had said because it was destroying me. I was carrying that burden. You know, it is right that we forgive others as Jesus has forgiven us. And I want to just have a look at the aspect, one aspect of the word to forgive and then I'll cover it in more detail. But when we look at Christ's forgiveness to us, um, it it means to completely cancel a debt. The word forgive, the verb, is aphemi. This is the Greek word aphemi, A-P-H-I-E-I-M-I. And in Greek it means to completely cancel a debt. So, you know, when we forgive somebody, we are cancelling the debt that they owe us, just as Jesus cancelled that debt for us. And I want to just share very quickly that parable of the unmerciful servant because it is, it is um, the word to us. In Matthew 18, verses 21 to 32, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? So they were asking Jesus the question, you know, because the Jewish law um, said that you needed to forgive up to seven times. 
But you know, the answer that Jesus gave was he said, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven. But you know, in the, in the other translations, that 70 times seven means unlimited, means always. It's not just the sum of 70, 70 times seven, but it is unlimited. And it says in that parable, Picking up on verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him and he said, please be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him and he cancelled the debt and he let him go. But when that servant went out, he found that one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred silver coins, he grabbed him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and he begged him, please be patient and I will pay it back. But he refused. And instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay that debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in and he said, you wicked servant, I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. But this is what Jesus said in verse 25. This is how my heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Boy, that's a challenge, isn't it? We do need to forgive. And even in the Lord's prayer, it says, forgive those that trespass against us. Just a couple of other scriptures that highlight the importance of forgiveness. Matthew 6 verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Colossians 3 verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You know, God requests that we forgive others so that we can let go of those hurts of the past, whether they, they were years ago, whether they were last week, whether they were yesterday, whether they were this morning. God wants us to forgive others as he forgave us. The third reason why we may struggle to let go of the past. We are bound by our past sin and our mistakes. Maybe those things that we've done that weren't glorifying to God, maybe the mistakes that we've made, are causing us to find it difficult to let go of the past. And we looked at that, that word, um, forgiveness, the verb, ephemi, which meant to cancel a debt. But let's see what else it says. It says, uh, in that word forgiveness means to deliver a sinner from a penalty. It also means, a second meaning, means a complete removal of the cause of offence by Christ on the tree, which is the cross. And we're going to look at that um, because... When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the ransom for our sin. And we'll look at the, what the Bible says shortly about curses, because Jesus became that curse for us. There's also the Greek word aphesis, which is A-P-H-I-S-I-S, -I -I which is the noun uh, f to forgive. It says dismissal or a release of sin to discharge or to set free, to send away and dismiss, a, dis a discharging or acquittal of a defendant, especially to remit punishment where the guilty person is dealt with as if they were innocent, acquitted of their sin, 
Jesus has paid that price. In Romans 5 verse says, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, sometimes we think, well, we can't be a Christian because we've made those mistakes and we're carrying this and we're still doing this. But you know, whilst we were still sinners, Christ gave his life for us. But it's as we repent of those things. That was mentioned earlier in the exhortation that Brian was giving. It's as we repent of those things that we are set free and we become a new person. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. You know, God has forgiven us all of our past mistakes once we've come to him to repent of those things, um, when he died on the cross for us, and that's when the curse was broken. So we've looked at those things, haven't we? I've got a fourth one here, number four, the reason why we find it difficult to let go of the past. We fail to recognise that the curse on our lives has been broken. I'll say that again. We fail to recognise that the curse on our lives has been broken. So how do we know that a curse has been broken? Firstly, what is a curse? When we look back in the Greek definition of, the, of a curse, it's the word ara, A-R-A. And it's to wish or to speak evil of anyone. So to wish evil on them or to speak evil on them. Something that is devoted to actually destroying them. And also it means to pierce with those words. You know, some, when we looked at the, the power of the tongue, the very first scripture I used, how it has the power to bring life or death. Words can pierce us. And we can remember those words that have been spoken to us. And the Bible talks of those as a curse. And it's only Jesus' death on the cross that released that curse. You know, in Galatians 3, this is the scripture I want to have a look at, but first of all, Christ ransomed us from the curse pronounced in the law by taking the curse on himself for us. Because scripture says that cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. And um, you can look back, I'm not going to read the particular scripture, but in Deuteronomy 21 verse 22 to 23, um, you know, when uh, someone was hanged um, on a tree, it defiled that piece of land and um, it, it had a curse on it. But in Galatians 3 verse 13 to 14, it said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written... Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You know, when it's talking about Christ became that curse for us, he volunteered to get on the cross to pay the penalty of that curse so that we could be broken free from it. And, thi- and this means that he, he was identified on our behalf with the doom of that sin. Our, the price of that sin was paid when Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus paid the price of that curse. We've been set free from mistakes, failings, and the effect of the curse. So we need to recognise that that curse has been broken in Jesus' name. Okay, the fifth reason, this is the final reason now, why we can find it often often difficult to move on from the, from the past, is when we fail to make the right decision to go forward. We fail to make the right decision to go forward. No one can force us, not even God can force us to make a particular decision. God has given us a free will and it's up to us what we do. 
you know, we know what Jesus has done for us. So we know what we need to do about it. Do we keep on singing, sinning? Do we keep on living according to what has happened in our past? Are we indifferent to what, is, what we're doing? You know, this morning it's time to make a choice. Are you making the right decision to go forward? You know, in the Old Testament times, God spoke to Moses and he warned the people that if they didn't, didn't uh, follow the law, then they would be destroyed. And it says in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, it says, If, so there's a condition, isn't there? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You know, there is a condition placed on that. Um, that if, if they didn't turn from their wicked ways, then um, that healing wouldn't come. There would be destruction upon that land. And that was the, the word that uh, the Lord gave to Solomon. Um, David, his father, had passed away, and so Solomon was the king at that time. And uh, God clearly warned him and said, if, if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn away, from their past, from the things that they've been doing in the past, then I will, I will take and forgive their sins. We have a choice, don't we? We have a choice whether to choose life or death. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I'm, go I'm not going to read it all, um, but, you know, it talks about, in 11 to 14, it talks about, you know, what God is saying to us here is not difficult. It's not beyond our reach. It's saying it's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond. But it's very, in verse 14 it says, the word is very near. In fact, it's in our mouth and in our heart so that we can obey it. And in, re, and in verse 19 it says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Now choose life. That life in Jesus. That life that has been set free from your past. A life where you're free to be the person that God intended you to be. Now choose life, it says, so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold on fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It's almost like a plea from the Lord, isn't it? Don't choose death. Choose life. Choose that abundant life in me. You know, that doesn't mean that we are at a point of perfection before we do that. Being a Christian is a process. Yes, it's making that decision to say, Lord God, I know that I've done wrong. But I come before you in repentance. I'm sorry, Lord. In our heart, we, we come before God and we repent of those things. And, you know, one of my favourite scripture, apart from the ones about the eagles, is, my, is the one in Philippians where Paul pours out his heart and he encourages us that no matter you know, what, what mistakes we've made, he's saying just leave, leave the past behind you. And I'm going to finish on that scripture, Philippians 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take a hold of that which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. I forget what is behind and I'm straining towards what is ahead and I press on to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. That's our encouragement this morning, is to forget the past. Let go of the things that have been hindering those things letting go we've looked at them haven't we we've said that it could be a deep-rooted fear 
We've said it could be unforgiveness. You know, we've said that we maybe we haven't recognised um, about the curse. You know, we, we're bound by our past sin and our mistakes. And finally, as I've said, it's time to make the right decision because sometimes we can fail to make that right decision to go forward. I pray that we will make that right decision. Come on, let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who hung on the tree for us. He paid the price for our sin. He took the curse upon his life that we may be set free from that curse. And Lord God, as the Apostle Paul prayed, let us leave the things of the past behind and let us strain forward to reach the goal, heavenwards in Christ Jesus. So I pray, Lord God, that you will help each and every one of us to leave the things that have been negative in the past behind and to embrace a positive future, a positive future in Jesus Christ, a life, choose life. I pray this morning that those that have been struggling maybe with sin, those that have been struggling with unforgiveness will find new life in you, Jesus. I pray that you will touch hearts and lives this morning, whether they're a part of this church or not, that today will be a new day and we will win the prize leaving the past behind and embracing an abundant, positive, fruitful future in Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you have a blessed week and uh, we'll keep you posted on what's happening um, in terms of meeting. We're still not able to meet together, um, but we'll keep you posted if things should change. And... Uh, you know, we are looking at things carefully to see whether it's possible to meet. Uh, but in the meantime, take care and uh, miss you all, but see you soon. Bye for now.